Welcome to Lacrosse Classified on the LAX All-Stars Podcast Network. Your home for the latest news from the National Lacrosse League and Indoor Lacrosse. Now, let's talk some lacrosse with your hosts, Jake Elliott and Evan Schemenauer. What's going on, lacrosse fans? It's Tuesday, and you know what that means. It's time for another episode of Lacrosse Classified here on the LAX All-Stars Podcast Network. This is episode number 51, and that means we are one episode away from a full calendar year of Lacrosse Classified. That'll happen next week. This is episode number 51. It's Jake Elliott, Evan Sheminar, back with you, and a great program lined up here today as we continue our Stampede Tech and Western Wear NLL season previews. We have done Buffalo, Calgary, Colorado, Georgia, New England, and who else am I missing? Who did we have last week? We had Halifax on, as I I remember myself. So if you go through the alphabet, Evan, you will realize that this week it's the New York Riptide and the Philadelphia Wings who are on deck, and we're going to talk to the two general managers and the two head coaches, which just happen to be the same guys. We're not going to have four guys on. It's two guys, but we're going to have Reggie Thorpe on in about 20 minutes, the head general manager, head coach of the Riptide, and then coach and GM Paul Day from the Philly Wings will join us here on Lax Class in about half an hour, 35 minutes. Now is lots to get to here this week, Evan. Uh, just getting on the phone with you now here on a beautiful Monday morning. I just got back to the gym. I I had to uh, push our, our start time back a little bit. I got a little carried away there. I'm still kind of stuck, Evan, right around uh, the 307 mark, which is as late as I've been in I don't know how many years, but I still got another 15 to crank off by the end of the year and i've been stuck in a bit of a holding pattern here so i got after it extra hard today i'm just getting my home gym set up again and fixing a few things so i can finally get back on my track once vegas is finished it's going to be a little easier it's impossible to lose weight in vegas 100 percent impossible i swear to god well you were doing like twenty thousand steps a day there i don't know it's hot you should have been sweating yeah it's stay away from the buffet man well, I mean, yeah, you've never been to Vegas, so you understand quickly when you get to Vegas just how much walking is involved because these resorts are massive. Even if you find the closest parking stall to where you're going to that night, it's still probably a couple thousand steps to get to where you need to get to. But, yeah, the the buffets, although I've learned how to work the buffets, and that is like... <laughs> like a, I've learned how to work the buffets too, Evan. Yeah, but here's here's the trick to it. If you if you don't want to kill yourself, is like eat something really really light for breakfast, and then hit the buffet at like two three in the afternoon, and that'll probably last you the rest of the day. Mm. Mm. Uh, yeah, uh, that they don't say that is the the proper way to go about things, Evan. Just so you know, they the the experts, uh, from what I understand tell you that it's better to just graze throughout the day small portions but constant kind of just keep the fuel burning but you know and you're you're gonna go in the your opposite you're saying load up on one meal and let that kind of carry you through the day i don't know if that's the right approach but anyways enough about vegas enough about buffets uh you just had a blizzard in saskatoon last night is that right yeah that's right um well what about well, Four inches on the ground this morning, but the thing about it is, like, for that's normally not a big issue for us. The issue is, is that the first little bit of it melted straight to the or froze straight to the ground, so that made everything a little bit treacherous this morning. But it wouldn't be Halloween in Sa- in Saskatoon if you weren't trying to fit your kid's costume over their snowsuit. <laughs> And I guess the good part about when you're driving around in Saskatoon in the snow and in the ice, like there's no hills really to speak of. So if you're if you're going to slide, at least you're sliding flat. Although there's one treacherous hill that I got to go between my house and my work, and it's always where the traffic problem is every single time. Mm, yeah, no, I always found it pretty curious uh, why your your junior football team is is called the Hilltops. 
in Saskatoon when there's not a lot of hills, but apparently there's one hill that they played football on that wherever their field is there. By the way, it's looking like my Langley Rams, Evan, who are now a perfect 11-0 and and into the Cullen Cup here, which is the BCFC final, on a collision course once again to meet the Saskatoon Hilltops in the Canadian Bowl. I hear that the Hilltops were victorious over Edmonton yesterday. And uh, these two are, are on a collision course for another rematch in the Canadian Bowl uh, in a couple of weeks from now. Surprisingly close game. I think it was only 2014 heading into the fourth. But, yeah, the Hilltops have dominated this league for They've decades They've dominated now, junior and, football in Canada yeah. for a decade. Yeah, and, uh, you know, great to see Langley there. I don't like their odds against the Hilltops. Well, they're they're playing on their home field this year, Evan. It's coming west this year. They're going to play at home, and that kind of changes everything. That's I, I a little different than playing a- in minus 40 in Saskatoon to maybe uh, playing in plus yeah. 10 here in Langley. I might have to start with a 30-point line, though, to begin with, to be honest. Okay, I'm, I'm going to take you up on that. I'm going to take you up on that. We're going to lay down something on that when uh, when the date is set. Mark my words. Don't let me forget that, Evan. Okay? Let's get on. That was a uh, – we had weather talk. We had Vegas talk. We had football. How about we talk some lacrosse here on Lacrosse Classified, Evan Schemenauer. Uh Let's get into our Stampy Tack and Western Wears NLL season previews, New York and Philadelphia on deck here. If you don't know, you should know, and I'm going to tell you if you don't, so listen closely. Stampy Tack and Western wear more than just a boot store. They carry a wide range of hats that keep you protected from the sun, the rain, the wind, the snow, you name it. Camping, fishing, hiking, anything that you would do outdoors, walking in Vegas maybe. Find a hat for you at Stampy Tack and Western wear, and you can shop online at stampede.ca. And they might even ship that package right to you. So, uh, Evan, New York is up first. Acquisitions, you got listed down as everybody. Everyone. Everyone, Evan, is what you listed down. Everyone's an acquisition this year, yeah. Okay. So let's start with the key key acquisitions, Evan. Yeah. Let me run that (laughs) down. Oh. You leave me with my notes hanging here. <laughs> uh, the key ones there, of course, Dan McCray um, in Calgary coming across. A big loss for the Roughnecks. But, um, Huge game here move. for the, for the Reptile. Yeah, and, and they were smart about that because in the expansion draft, you can draft a, one player that's going to be an unrestricted free agent as long as he hasn't turned 34 yet. And you can franchise tag him and hold him. Um, I don't think they ended up using the franchise tag in the end on McCray, but they could have. And that's really what kind of uh, drove that one there. Uh, they get Alex Bouquet out of New England, a big pickup there. Kieran McCardle out of Toronto they got. And the key there is he's a Long Island boy. He's a hometown boy. And probably going to be one of the, the poster childs for that franchise. They get Tyler Digby out of New England as well, and as, as we stated last week, he's from Pittsburgh, so it's not a huge. Well, trip he's actually for him from get... New Westminster, Evan, but now resides in Pittsburgh. Okay, that's where the wife is from. Yeah, and another local guy, New York guy, John Ranigan, out of Georgia, they've got, and the youngster Connor Kelly out of San Diego, who was a first round draft pick. Yeah, and I think for those deals a year ago. Those last two guys you just mentioned there, John Ranigan, Connor Kelly. I think those are two of their biggest key acquisitions there. One up front, one out of the back. And I was just the, – the more I watch Rannigan play, and, and we got a firsthand look at him at the World Championships with Team USA, the more I'm impressed with him and just his motor alone. Uh, the way he plays the game is is super entertaining to watch, and it's infectious. Like other guys want to get after it as hard as he is when they watch Rannigan play. Um, key losses here. Jordan Durston traded away. They get Fournier back along with Connor Farrell and the rights to Miles Jones. Don't no word on whether Miles is going to suit up or, or take an attempt at playing in the National Cross League. I, I, my hopes aren't high, even though my hopes are super high that he actually tries it, but I don't think he's going to, which is a little disappointing. Uh, of course, they, they drafted Jeff Cornwall in the expansion draft. But New York uh, trades him back to Saskatchewan, and they end up getting Tyson Bomberry in that exchange. 
Of course, Tyson Bomberry was the draft pick that they had acquired from the Rush, who had acquired it from Toronto uh, to get that pick. They needed to get, Rush really wanted to get Cornwall back, and it didn't make sense for somebody that's based out of Coquitlam to, to fly to New York all the time, especially when Cornwall is just starting his firefighting career. So it made sense for both teams to get that deal done. A little surprising to see Halifax be the team to pick up Peter Dubinsky. You want to talk about a long commute. Coquitlam to upstate New York is one thing. You're talking Nanaimo <laughs> to Halifax. I don't think uh, – Pete's got to be relocating, does he not? Yeah, he's got to be moving to the market or something. Cause the, the, this, like, you'd have I'm to start that happy. trip I'm a su- day early. Yeah, I'm super happy for Pete. Um, because, I mean, that realistically is – Probably two connections. I don't know if there's a direct flight between New York and Vancouver, or sorry, Halifax and Vancouver. But no, I don't think there know, is. Nanaimo, Nanaimo on a prop plane to Vancouver, Vancouver to Pearson, Pearson to Halifax, yeah. and you're switching How four time zones in the pier in the uh, or three time zones in the different. Saskatchewan so going there. to Halifax uh, this season, so a bunch of guys from here will. Have to make that trip. Uh, they won't have the Nanaimo connector, but uh, we'll we'll get a good indication on just how long and how grueling that trip is there to Halifax. Uh, draft picks here for New York. Of course, they had the number one overall selection and surprised a lot of people here with the number one overall pick, although I think it's a pretty good pick in Tyson Gibson, the right-handed forward, who goes number one. Yeah, it was a shock, and this is... This is stupid, me going at the uh, the Rush draft party and literally breaking down this draft for everybody and telling them, you can write Andrew Q's name down number one. <laughs> and because just had traded Jordan Durston the day before the draft. Yeah. So when they did that, it was like, okay, now you, you needed a lefty before. Now you really need a lefty. <laughs> this seems so certain. Um, but it'll be interesting to ask Reggie Thorpe why what he saw in Gibson over uh, Q that made him go that direction. Yeah, we'll have to ask. Uh, there's Tyson Bomberry at number 10. That was the Cornwall trade back, uh, the pick from Saskatchewan. Second round, they get Jake Fox at 19, Connor Farrell at 24, and uh, the drum manager's son, who was also impressive at the World Championships, and Gail Thorpe, as uh, there's a left-handed forward to maybe help fill the void left by Jordan Durston. And you have down here a key unknown. Well, we just got known, I suppose, Evan, uh, just before coming on the, the air here, that Angus Goodleaf uh, has been ruled out uh, from playing due to health precautions. Yeah, it's sad to see that, but I it's the right move if he's out. I don't know if he's out for the year or out for part of the year, but... You know, you got to take something Air on the that side of caution. serious. Yeah, I, I mean, the last thing I'd want for him is to take a shot square in the middle of the chest and there's another ambulance call coming to revive yeah. him. You yeah, know? so he'll probably have to go through a bunch of testing and, and make sure that everything is, is copacetic for, you know, a, a stretch of time, sit three months, six months, whatever it is, uh, before he will be cleared to play again. Uh, we're all wishing the best for for Angus Goodleaf, obviously, uh, one of the good guys in the league, and uh, we hope he can return, as I'm sure Reggie Thorpe and, and the New York Riptide are, are keeping their fingers crossed as well. Uh, scheduling quirks here for the Riptide, Evan. First three games on the road. Home opener is December 28th against Saskatchewan. Riptide play the night before in New England. Twelve games before the end of February, only three in March and three in April. So a heavily front-loaded schedule here for the Riptop. And a tough one, and it's, uh, I don't think anything's going to be easy for them. Uh, I don't think anything's going to be easy for any team, but when you're playing that heavy front-loaded schedule, you've got to be ahead of guys to start because you don't have the games to catch up at the end. Um, and I wish that they would have more rest for their home openers, you know, the, the revitalization from mm. the home crowd. You know, they're going to be – that game in New England the night before is a critical game for them, you know, to that, that's going to add up over the course of the season for a playoff shot. And 
they're going to come in fairly tired. Yeah, you know what, game. though, Evan? Like, I, I mean, all these teams go through this, and I, and I've watched enough teams on back to back nights in the National Lacrosse League where, like, I, I just don't know if fatigue is is playing that big of a role over the course of an entire season. I think so, but. I don't, like I, I've seen just as many teams playing on the back half of a back-to-back win games as I've seen them lose, and I these are professional athletes in supreme shape. And I just like I don't know if playing on back, to, yeah, the travel and all the rest of it, you get banged up, but every team's going to go through it. And I don't like you can't use it as an excuse. And if and if you're no. and if you're getting tired on the second half of a back-to-back, whether it be the third quarter or the fourth quarter or whatever then you're not in good enough shape because this is part of what the National Lacrosse League is. This is something that's not going anywhere. So you better prepare your team for it. You better be prepared as a player for it and get your head around it because it's not going anywhere. No, every team's got these back-to-backs. I understand that much. But it, it's tough enough to beat Rush on the on the best of nights. Then they have to do it after you just played another game the night before, it's going to make it that much more difficult. Yeah, well, um, I'm, a little, I'm a little surprised to hear you concerned about the Riptide being fresh enough to play the Rush, Evan. I, I quite frankly, a little, little concerned that uh, you're concerned about something like that. Hey, lacrosse fan, first Rush fan, second. Uh, I've always said that, right? Yeah, well, I, I still have a... a a picture of you sporting some Toronto rock gear in my back pocket that I could throw out online. Like, like I, like I said, lacrosse fan first, right? Like I've got a Calgary Roughnecks yeah. jersey that yeah. Jim Ells gave me there. Well, why, you know, why, why you wear that to the second. to the Rush home opener then, Evan? Why don't you just uh, pull that on? And you know what? That that wouldn't actually um, throw too many people off. As soon the second they see the back of the jersey, they'd understand. Mm-hmm. I don't. I don't know if I would. I don't know. <laughs> you want to walk into the Sastel Center wearing a Roughnecks jersey? Uh, I, I might actually entice you, but like I might give you some money to do that. Well, okay. You know what? If if there's money on the line, then I might actually do it. Because yeah. the thing is, everybody's going to be wearing almost the exact same jersey going into that night, that fifth anniversary jersey. Yeah, you'll that. stick out like a sore thumb even more. Uh, well, maybe we'll, uh, maybe we'll, we'll incorporate that into the old Hilltops Rams, uh, wager somehow. All right, let's move on to the Philadelphia Wings here, Evan, before we get to Reginald Thorpe, uh, acquisitions for the Philly Wings. They go and get a couple of goaltenders, which obviously that was a bit of a a crutch for them last year, Evan, with, with, uh, Buckin and, and Gowie, or Go Abrams. They need some help and goal, and, and they go out and get a real proven, bona fide NLL starter. And B. Miller, Brandon Miller, out of retirement, and then pick up Zach Higgins as well, who's kind of been a guy that's been right on the threshold of becoming an NLL starter for a long time, and maybe this is his year to grab a starting job in the National Lacrosse League. And then uh, a couple of veterans in Ian Lord and Corey Vitarelli as well. Lord and Vitarelli, of course, were um, rental players at the at the trade deadline last year. They became available, and you know, a, a decent fit for them there. Um, Philly's goaltending problems we've seen it last year, and this is the thing about Philadelphia. Keep in mind, they were four and fourteen last year, and probably the best four and four fourteen team ever. And I looked this up this morning because it's like. <laughs> Trying to think back to the real stats from last year. Out of those 14 losses, seven of them, they were either leading or tied in the fourth quarter and lost. Right? So they're, the two keys with Philly really are they either they got to stop the first quarter runs. They were down 5 nothing far too often last year. Mm-hmm. And the fourth quarter issue. Yeah. So... And, so that t- that tells me, Evan, that like they need to work on their pregame preparation a little bit. I don't know if they need to tweak their warm up or whether it's it's the routine that they're going through, but they need to get out of the gates quicker and come ready to play. And the other side of that is is maybe their fitness has to be questioned as well because 
if you're leading games in the fourth quarter and you're con- and you're consistently blowing leads in the fourth quarter, it tells me that's that's physical. And once the body starts to break down, then the mental game starts to go on you as well. And that's when bad decisions and, and undisciplined things start to creep into the game when you're physically tired. And if you're not finishing games off, especially when you have a lead in the fourth quarter, that tells me that, that maybe the fitness is an issue there in Philadelphia, or at least was. Yeah, they, they had tried uh, changing the warm-up routine around where they actually went out for less time to try and solve the back-end problem. And unfortunately, created a front-end problem. So, you know, it's a balancing issue. Mm-hmm. You know, but you got to place a full 60 minutes. Is there the co- – like, and that's the thing. is that once it happened two or three times, this confidence just went – Well, that's it because – because- when that happens, like you said, two or three times, then when you got that two goal lead in the fourth quarter, that bench is thinking, "Man, are we going to hang on to this? Is it going to slip away on us again? They're going to have a comeback." And, and you're thinking, you 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 start playing to not lose instead of continuing to play to win, and that's the mental psyche. And that's where your leadership comes in. That's where your your coaching staff comes in to instill that belief. Like, hey, we're in a good spot here. Let's finish this thing off. And and I'm sure all the guys are saying the right things and all the rest of it, but it's that belief. you got to have that mm-hmm. belief that you're going to finish those games. And that's something that Philadelphia but, just didn't have. But here's the other key for Philadelphia, and that is with this revamped playoff format, New York and Philadelphia are in the same division. Mm-hmm. right? So if you finish third – Two out of those three third place teams are probably headed to the playoffs. It's possible both wild cards could go to the same division, but most likely two third place teams are going. They got to leapfrog one team, and they, you know, and you know, encompass just enough wins. They could be in the playoffs, and they, you know, once you're in the playoffs, we've seen it with Rochester in years sure. past, where. Yep. You barely make the playoffs, and you win the title. Yeah, no, I, I honestly think we're gonna we're gonna talk to Coach Day about it, but uh, I think a lot of adjustments will be made there in Philadelphia. Paul Day has been ultra successful with his Peterborough Lakers. Obviously, having three back to back to back man cups over the last three years, the guy knows how to win. He knows how to coach. He knows how to be a GM. And I think it was just a I think it was just a real tough first year. A lot of things went against the wings in that opening season for them. And I, like, I just, I can't see it going like that again. I, th- even if they clean up half of those wins that they let get away from them, they're going to be in way, way, way better shape. So we'll talk to, to coach day about it all. Uh, we got to get the break here, but other key departures from the Philadelphia wings, Chet Kinesny, who's signed in Halifax, Zach Reed, Doug Buckin, and the veteran Jordan Hall, who returns to Georgia. Expansion draft losses, I think this is a big one, and Frank Brown, who they lose, um, and Matt Bennett as well. Yeah, one big one in Frank Brown. That was a guy that they took early in the prior expansion right. draft. But Matt Bennett, they got him for nothing towards the end of the year, so... If you had to lose somebody, it's not the worst loss in the world. And and maybe the biggest thing for the Wings is they're going to get Brad Hickey back, who has obviously had some injury trouble over the last couple of years, but a former 50-goal scorer in this league and, and a guy that was kind of really just starting to hit his peak and his prime and, and has had a, a couple of bad injuries. But you got to think Hickey is going to be a motivated player coming back healthy and, and ready to go for another season. You just hope – for the best that he holds up for an entire yeah. schedule. And, and if he does, that's really going to help that offense there with, with Crowley and company on, on that left side for the righties. Yeah. And that's the thing is how well do Hickey and Crowley um, mesh together? We'll see. And that was the unfortunate thing was that they, they kind of forced their hand a bit more with Crowley when Hickey went down. Um, do they lose all those close games? If Hickey's in the lineup, maybe they get that extra goal. Yeah, probably they not, right? over the top. Yeah, because it, yeah. you're looking at, I mean, there's a few overtime games in there as well. You're looking at just one goal, and Hickey can certainly put the ball in the net. Uh, scheduling quirks here before we get to break, Evan. Three bye weeks in the opening four weeks. They don't play their season opener until week three of the schedule. 
They don't play their home opener until January 10th, only two games in April, so it's a very middle-packed schedule here where we saw a front end loaded for New York. This is kind of a middle-packed schedule for Philadelphia. Yeah, this was another one of the really odd ones because they have very few games in December, they have very few games in April. So you're jamming all these games right into the middle of the schedule, and so you got to take you got to be a little concerned about those first few games where other teams have now had two or three or four games under their belt and you're just getting going you know are you going to be game ready at that level that your opposition is and just the same as Colorado they only have two games in April they're going to need to be ahead of teams to make the playoffs because they don't have the games in April to catch up. And yeah, and you, and you wonder how many guys are living in market or how often these guys are getting together. Are they practicing in Toronto or at Six Nations or where? how exactly is that dynamic working? Because you're right, like with especially with a new team and, and new players coming together, like chemistry is a huge thing. And if you're only seeing these guys for a few hours per week and you don't really get a chance to work on your offense or your power play or special teams as much as you'd like to and the guys aren't around each other as much, it makes it that much more difficult to kind of come together as a team where you Mm -hmm. you look at at Toronto or Buffalo or here in Vancouver, it's much easier for guys just to kind of rally up on a Tuesday night and go throw the ball around and be around each other and talk about things, work on some things, whether coaches are there or not. It's a big advantage, and I don't know what the situation yeah. there is in Philly, whether they're meeting somewhere else, maybe not in Philadelphia, but at least they're getting together. I don't know if they can because they do have some in-market players, right? But I think this is another thing that Philly could potentially have a huge upside to, and that is they've got players like Matt Rambo that – you know, and Trevor Baptiste is the other one where this is now their second season of box lacrosse. They haven't had a lot of exposure. So the upside is that much greater in those kinds of players. Yeah. Yeah. No, uh, it's going to be interesting to watch guys like that kind of continue to develop with more box lacrosse experience. Speaking of box lacrosse, this is Lax Class, your number one source for all things National Lacrosse League and box lacrosse. Thanks for being a loyal listener here to Lacrosse Classified every single Tuesday. We're going to take a break, and we're going to come back on the other side with the general manager and the head coach of the New York Riptide, former Rochester Nighthawk player and captain. Reggie Thorpe is on the other side. Keep it right here on Lax Class on the Lacrosse All-Stars Podcast Network. Associated Labels and Packaging is in the business of creating first impressions. They'll help you reflect your company values accurately by offering solutions that fit your product needs. With the latest in printing technology and over 35 years of experience, Associated Labels and Packaging is the perfect fit for your company to take your labels and packaging to the next level. This is Rich Lisk, GM of the New England Blackwells. You're listening to Lax Class, your go-to source for all things NLL and box lacrosse. Growing the game one podcast at a time. Welcome back to Lacrosse Classified here on the Lax All-Stars Podcast Network. Into the second quarter we go, and a returner back on the pod. Oh, you just heard from our friends there at Associated Labels and Packaging. They create first impressions. Sean Ashworth, Tosh Nishimira, the gang in Coquitlam. You need a label or a package, find them at associated-labels.com or their social media at Associated LP, as in labels and packaging. Check out their daily blog and all they do for the environment as well. Top of the table, Associated Labels and Packaging. Check them out. Uh, Returning to the program, it's the general manager and the head coach. Of the New York Riptide, won himself a bronze medal at the World Championships as well with Team USA. It's Reggie Thorpe back with us. Reggie, thanks for doing this. Hey, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Our pleasure, man. Uh, I know you were a busy guy yesterday. Let's. Why don't we start there? You were. uh, You had a bit of an open camp. You were looking to get guys signed up. uh, Maybe let go a couple of guys. What can you tell us? uh, What went down there yesterday? Uh, yeah, no, we, we had a competitive uh, uh, camp on Saturday. We had our draft picks in, 
and then we had um, uh, about 37, 38 um, players in on an open trial uh, contract. So uh, it was good. I mean, super competitive. Guys battled hard. Um, you know, paid their own way to get there. So it was it was, uh, it was great. Uh, certainly great to get our draft picks rolling too and get that weekend under their belt before you go into the big weekend this weekend. So yeah, no, we just uh, grabbed some guys from that trial and we're bringing them on uh, onto this weekend. Um, going back to the draft that you, uh, you surprised the lacrosse world picking Tyson Gibson, number one over Andrew Q. We all thought you were going after a lefty, especially after you traded Jordan Gerson away just the day before. Take us through the thought process and why Gibson over Q. I don't think you can go wrong with either, either pick, um, you know, or the Reese kid, <laughs> you know, that Rochester pick. So. It was really, you know, just, just, just a feel. Uh, Marshall Abrams is our offensive coordinator. Uh, his system on offense maybe fits a little bit better for, for Gibson. Um, but, uh, I mean, Andrew Q is an unbelievable player. Uh, he's going to have a great career. Uh, the Reese kid is unbelievable as well. I know Rochester picked him. So really any of those top picks, I don't think he could go wrong with. We just saw a little bit better about a system that we're going to run, uh, with Gibson there. So yeah, Durston was unfortunate. I mean, we love Jordan Durston. We wanted to play for us. He just didn't want to play in in New York. So it sounded like, so we ended up moving him to new England, but, uh, you know, we wish him the best luck. He's a great, great, great kid. I had a great, uh, world games as well for the Iroquois. Yeah, he sure did. Uh, another guy that had a, a great tournament for the Iroquois is Tyson Bomberry. You pick him up with your 10th pick, uh, that you got from Saskatchewan in return for Jeff Cornwell, your other draft picks, Jake Fox, Connor Farrell, and some guy named Gail Thorpe, Thorpey, Gail Thorpe. Is that, is there a relationship there, Reg? Uh, there could be. It could be. <laughs> yeah. Well, talk about Gail, because I was actually, you know, I, I didn't know anything about Gail. He played Senior B uh, this past season. He, he played in the President's Cup, got to the gold medal game as well, if I do recall. But uh, really kind of stood out for me at the World Championships. And you lose a guy like Durston on that left-hand side. But I think you got to be feeling pretty confident having Gail there to kind of fill that void a little bit. Uh, I don't know if they're the exact same kind of player, but very similar. Yeah, I mean, Gail's, I mean, he's, uh, you know, he's, uh, he's been playing box, you know, since he was five. I'm the Onondaga Reservation here locally. You know, went off to college, uh, did a few stints up at Aquasusne, uh, Indians in the Junior B, and then uh, he went back this summer and played with the with the uh, Aqua Sesame Bucks, the new senior B team there. So uh, yeah, you know he had a good summer. He was working hard. He's trying to get ready for the World Games. So he knew playing um, playing the uh, you know Canadian lacrosse, box lacrosse. You know it's a big commitment time wise, but would be it would be key to, to having a good World Games there for the USA team. And yeah, he's doing well. He's coming along great. You know he's really fitting in well with the, with the draft picks um that we had this past weekend there and i just think he's got a, you know he's got a lot of upside he works hard you know and uh but he's got you know he's got a he's got a lot to learn and, and, and it's a process as we all know perhaps your biggest acquisition so far has been dan mccray and we talked about him when we had you on with the expansion draft and you know he was an unrestricted free agent you were prepared to use the franchise tag if you had to but in the end you worked out a, a two-year deal i believe it was and to have a cornerstone of a captain of the defending champions has got to be a pretty big building block to getting your team moving forward. Uh, it's huge. You know, I mean, it comes down to the leadership, you know, especially with our makeup of our team. You know, we got some, you know, a guy like Danny McRae, John Rannigan, uh, Tyler Digby. You know, we're, we're really excited about Tyler Digby's uh, leadership, uh, uh, McCardle. Um, so we, we got some guys that, uh, been around the league there, but obviously Danny is is uh, you know proven leader there, and, and we're going to need that with some of our our, our young pers- our young people, and uh, certainly uh, in, in the locker room and how to handle yourself on and off the field. So you know Danny's a we're, we couldn't be more excited to have him get him down to New York and uh, and really lead our, our organization, our team on and off the field. Speaking with the general manager and head coach of the New York Riptide here on Lax Class, Reggie Thorpe and out of all the guys you do have is great. One guy that you, you're not going to have, it looks like is Angus Goodleaf, who has been deemed physically unable to play. And that's, you know, we're all thinking about Angus and, and health is obviously paramount for him. We want him to get better, but it's a loss for you between the pipes. You got Alex Bouquet. What, what's the situation in goal heading into training camp without uh, Angus there, Reggie? Well, you know, I mean, we're, you know, we're sending our best to Angus and his family there. And, you know, obviously, you know, we, we wish him the best, but, uh, you know, we're, we're, 
we're hoping, you know, he's still, he's still very hopeful working with his doctors and uh, hasn't been cleared yet. So we had to put him on the physically unable to perform, but, uh, you know, we're hoping he can make a return. And like I said, we just wish him the best health wise in there. And, uh, but yeah, we had, we had bouquet and then we, we had some guys in the, in this weekend, uh, Craig Seneca, uh, Sam Burrell who played up in the president's cup. Um, and then David Mathers who played with our, our USA team out in, uh, in Langley. So yeah, we're, we're, we're trying to, you know, we're, we're obviously, we, we got some, some players vying for that, that backup spot. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see as, as, uh, as, you know, everyone gets to camp this weekend and, and, and you know, where, where they where you know, and how, how they perform. You have a few hometown guys, which especially building a new team is going to be critical. You got McArdle, you got Rannigan. And then the thing that probably triggered Jake and I is at, attention pretty quickly was you acquired the rights to miles jones and we pray to the lacrosse gods that he will finally step in between the boards is there any chance we will see him say maybe a year from now or probably not this year but in the future you're hoping that he's going to finally give it a chance yeah, no, we've, we've had uh, our assistant general manager, Lance Basser, and myself, we've had great talks with, with uh, Miles uh, in, in the, 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 the organization he's, he's working with. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, we're, we're, we're hoping he for this year. I mean, that's what, that's what we're pushing for. We want to get into camp. He won't be at camp this week. We're trying to work on some details. But, yeah, I mean, with his size and speed, I mean, we feel like he could be a, a great D training guy. He's from Long Island. Uh, although he's living in Atlanta, Georgia there. But like I said, we, we couldn't be more excited to get his rights, and we're, we're doing everything in our power to get him out uh, on, on the floor. And like I said, I think he could be a big contributor coming out of the end and, and getting the ball off the ground and, and pushing up, especially with his, his big body and his athleticism. So you're you're telling us right now, Reggie Thorpe, that the dream is still alive. There's a chance. There's a chance that Miles Jones – The dream Jones... is still alive. I mean, okay. We, we, we feel – I mean, Miles is a great kid. You know, he's a professional – uh, I mean, we're dealing with his, with his agent, but he's calling us and, and communicating with Lance and, uh, he, he's just like, he's just a class act kid. And, and, um, you know, we're, we're doing everything we can to, to get him on the floor. He's been great to work with and, and negotiate. So we're, we're working on oh, that's that. That's great. Like I said, we, we hope he won't be this week, but we're hoping, uh, maybe for the following weekend. All right. We're keeping our fingers crossed here on lacrosse classifies. We speak with Reggie Thorpe. Uh, let's hit the schedule here a little bit. Reggie, you, have the first three games on the road. The home opener comes on December the 28th at the Nassau County Coliseum. Oh, uh, is it still called that? I should probably get my head around that. What, what's the arena called there in, in, in Long Island now? Yeah, and, and NYCB Live, uh, Nassau, at the Nassau Coliseum. Yeah. Okay, um, so December 28th, the Rush are coming to town. What can you tell us uh, for the fans who are going to be in attendance for the home opener? What can they expect to see and hear and, and all that sort of stuff when they come to a Riptide game? Well, it's, I mean, the, the great thing is we're going to get in there this weekend on the big floor at the Col- Nassau Coliseum. We're having an open house on this Saturday, on November 2nd, uh, 4 to 6. They're going to come in. The fans are coming in. Uh, I think there's about 1,000 to 1,200 fans coming in, meet and greet with the team after, watch the scrimmage. So, uh, I'm just excited for our guys to get in the Coliseum. That, that's going to be, you know, one of only a few chances that we get in before we play December 28th against the Saskatchewan Russia home opener. But, uh, I mean, obviously it's a, it's a tough draw opening up with, you know, an organization, uh, you know, like the Saskatchewan Rush and, and, uh, you know, Derek Keeney, the veteran coach. So, but, but we're excited. You know, it's going to be a great challenge for us to open up, especially we play the night before at, at New England. Um, so, you know, so we're at the digger cleats in and, then uh, it, it really be ready for, for that, that home opener, but, uh, uh, we're, we're excited about it. Tell me, tell me about the turf Reggie at the Nassau Coliseum. Is there going to be turquoise on the turf? Like the low, I can't wait to see the logo and the turf in New York. Tell me about it. They're, 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 it comes in, they, they, <laughs> they're laying it, laid it out on Friday. So, uh, excuse me, after the hockey game on Friday, cause I know the Islanders play Friday night. We're, we're, us and the boys are heading over, okay. heading over to the game there. But yeah, they're, they're setting up Friday night, so it's going to be uh, it, it, our first session is ten to twelve on Saturday um, on the, on, the, on, the, on the November second, and then like I said, the, the, our open session to the to the public and fans is going to be four to six. So there'll be some good pictures on Twitter coming All right. here. But All uh, right. we can't, oh, reveal, hang on. can't reveal it quite yet. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> Difference between building an expansion team and teams that you're used to in the past. Is that you have an established team, you have established players, established positions, and you're trying to fill a few holes. 
when you're on an expansion team now, you're trying to fill every hole and bring guys that are not as used to playing together as they're used to. What's the approach to building the riptide? Well, I, I think, you know, you, you know, the, the, the staff's done a good job, a uh, great job of identifying some of our, you know, uh, areas of, 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 you know, where we want to focus on. And, you know, we, we got some guys that are, are veterans in the roster. We got some, some young guys we feel with a lot of upside potential. And then we got some of those middle of the road players that have been knocked around from the practice squad, off the practice squad, on the active roster, have some experience and they're hungry and they, and they want an opportunity. So, those guys are super motivated to, to get that opportunity to make an active roster. Uh, so we want guys that are hungry and, and, and that's one, one of our, you know, one of our, our, our pillars that we talked about. We want guys that, that are hungry. They want to be there. Like I said, we have some guys that have been kicked around, um, you know, and, and done everything they can to stay in the league and bounce from practice spot to inactive to active. And, you know, we're excited to land some of those guys and, 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 and those guys are going to prove themselves. And, 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 you know, it's, uh, we're excited to see what we can get out of that. And, so we have camp this weekend, and then we're heading up to, to Buffalo um, to play. You know, we got, we got some practices, and we're going to be uh, scrimmaging the, the, the Rochester night off. So we'll certainly get a, an opportunity to see, you know, a me- get our measuring stick of where we are against, you know, the, the other expansion team. It, it must be like a relief, Reggie, in some regard to look back a, a year ago or whatever it was when you were hired by the Riptide and to go through – the expansion draft and the entry draft and get all these players under your stable to finally kind of see the light at the end of the tunnel. Like the season's only uh, just over a month away. Training camp is just days away now. There's got to be, I know there's lots of work to be done, but there's got to be some sort of sense of, I guess maybe a bit of relief, some accomplishment in there as well. But I, I would think excitement is probably at the forefront. I mean, it's just been exciting. I mean, again, just getting the open trial last week and getting our draft picks in and getting all the coaches on board and, 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 uh, just, just kind of getting that out of the system where <clears throat> it was really good for us, you know, from an organization standpoint to work out <clears throat> some of our kinks, um, you know, going into, you know, our first official training camp with our, with our 40 players and our veterans and that. So it was just great to get on the floor last week and, and uh, like I said, uh, and then certainly as we reflect on, on our Monday morning staff call, and some things we need to do better as an organization, as coaches, as, as uh, you know, just our system. So that was good just to kind of get a dry run to go through and uh, or trial run, excuse me, and, and then as we roll into this big train camp this weekend. So I guess the, when we look at the uh, future here, what's the goal at this stage? Just make the playoffs and see what happens? Uh, what's the expectation for a first-year team? Well, I think, you know, our, our ownership, you know, GF Sports is, I mean, they, they want to win, you know, and, and at the same time, they understand that the process is, you know, our expansion team. But, you know, certainly with a new format, uh, with, with the divisions and, the, the, you know, two making playoffs, you know, I mean, you know, it's, you know, we're in a tough conference with, with Georgia, New England, and, you know, two playoff teams from last year and Philly, Philly, who was, you know, you know, a couple one goal games away from being in the playoffs. So, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be tough, you know, but, but obviously that, 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 that's going to be our goal. But we're just excited to, you know, uh, see where we're at, you know, and then uh, see if we got, some, you know, we feel we got some piece of the puzzles together. But it, it's going to be a process. And, you know, we're going to learn a lot about ourselves, um, you know, over, over the next, uh, you know, four weeks before we open up uh, at Halifax there. So we're just excited for that. But the organization, like, you know, they've been super supportive and they understand the process and, and they're in it for the, the long haul. Um, you know, we just, uh, you know, they, they made a huge commitment to Long Island tri-state area for, for box to be back. Uh, and, and, uh, they, they've taken that, that long-term approach. Well, can be more fired up about it. I know, I know my lady Reggie just absolutely loves the riptide hats. So I think maybe when Saskatchewan comes to town, we might have to arrange, uh, getting a riptide hat off you because those things are, pre- those things are pretty now. Like I, I just, the color scheme, the logo, I love the riptide swag, man. So, uh, we'll look forward to that. We'll look forward to the riptide kicking off. Their inaugural season there in New York. Uh, congratulations, man, on winning the bronze medal there at the World Championships with Team USA. Appreciate your time, Reggie Thorpe, and uh, we'll have you back on soon. All right. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. All right. That was Reggie Thorpe, head coach, general manager of the New York Riptide, and just uh, days, weeks away from kicking off the season now, Evan. Yeah, and it's going to be uh, interesting to see how they do. You never know with some of these expansion teams where they find these diamonds in the rough like San Diego did last year and made a run. Um, 
they're in tough. They got Georgia in their division, which was never going to be easy. But can they surprise? Heck, what did Kurt Malowski say when they played San Diego last year? If you think San Diego is an expansion team, you've lost it. So never <laughs> underestimate an expansion <laughs> team. We're still <laughs> waiting for Austin Owens to uh... – Get on that. Get Kurt Malosky's all his bench interviews from the year and just mash those together. And I'm telling you, it's going to be soundbite gold right there if uh, if somebody makes that, that happen. Um, truth be told here, Evan, we're recording this interview with Reggie, or we just recorded this interview with Reggie on Tuesday morning. We did the rest of the show on Monday, and it's a long one here, so prepare yourself. But I want to get this in now because I forgot to do it in the fourth quarter. And that we're just we're full disclosure here. We're we're recording out of order, so don't get all confused. But anyways, uh, an update on the Rhinestone Cowboy saga here, Evan. Uh, <laughs> apparently, uh, the the. The information, the intel, if you will, uh, about where karaoke was available in my fine city of Port Coquitlam was from 2015. <laughs> so so uh, tonight was supposed to be the big night. I was going to go to the place and do the... But apparently that's that's not happening here this evening. They do not have karaoke anymore. Uh, so we're on the hunt again. I think I found a new place to do this. The goal is to accomplish it before we get rolling again for who you got uh, for NLL season. So I still got some sure, time. Sure, sure, But it's, it's going to happen. <laughs> I, try, I try. Listen, uh, it's it's going to happen. So I just wanted to get that quick update in there because I forgot to, to inform the fans. I know everybody's on the edge of their seat waiting to, to see that performance. So uh, there you go. All right. Uh, <laughs> let's get to break. Paul Day, head coach and general manager of the Philadelphia Wings, is coming up next year on Lacrosse Classified. Keep it right here on the Lacrosse All-Stars Podcast Network. Pure Vita Labs is proud to bring you the highest quality sports supplements on the market. PVL products are 100% all natural with no artificial flavors, colors, or sweeteners. And the entire line is also informed choice certified. We designed all our products with the athlete in mind. We look forward to being a part of your athletic achievements, helping you push the bar higher, win at the highest levels, and set personal records for years to come. Hey, this is Chris Corville, captain of Team Canada and the Saskatchewan Rush. You're listening to Lacrosse Classified on the Lax All-Stars Podcast Network. Welcome back. This is Lacrosse Classified, Lax Class for short. You got it right here on the Lacrosse All-Stars, or Lax All-Stars for short, Podcast Network. Jake Kelly and Evan Shemin are with you. Just heard from our friends at Pure Vital Labs. Anything else would be on Sportsmanlike. Find them at pvl.com. Trevor Baptiste, the Philadelphia Wing, he's on the PVL supplements. All natural, no artificial flavors or colors. They're informed choice certified. And the best supplements on the market. The Beast Baptiste wouldn't take them if they weren't. He plays for the Philadelphia Wings. We have the man who coaches the Philadelphia Wings. He is the head coach and the general manager of the second year Philly Wings. Paul Day back on the podcast. Coach, welcome back. Hey guys, thanks for having me. Appreciate Thank, it. Yeah, thanks for coming on, man. Uh, listen, last year, Evan and I talked about it off the top. Probably the best four and fourteen team we've ever seen. Things just did not go your way, especially late in games. A lot of one goal losses. Looking to turn that around here, obviously, this year and, and making some moves, especially in goal. Lots to talk about here with you, Paul. But uh, w- summarize last year and, and the outlook for this year. Like, d- do you just kind of put that one behind you and say, like, let's move on? Or do you try and take some learning lessons from that past season and implement them into going into this campaign? Yeah, I mean, obviously, we weren't happy with our record. But, uh, you know, we when we started to work on building the team we wanted to to build you know a two-year three-year plan and uh you know we wanted to make sure we had youth that could grow together um you know everybody has injuries we end up having five season ending injuries but at the same time top four in the league in offense which we know offense is tough to come 
by, you know, you look at this year's draft and really, you know, two or three guys, let's say three guys that will probably be legit 20 goal scorers, 20 to 30 goal scorers. So it's really tough to come by. We've got a group, we think offensively, we get Brett Heckey back for more than three games this year that, uh, you know, again, we can be in the top three in offense. Um, you know, youth, obviously, in, ex- in experience, uh, our average age was under 24 defensively last year. And uh, in goal, we were pretty young. Uh, we had some guys that had good summers, but we, you know, we, we made a, a conscious decision to change our goaltending this year. Really wasn't fair for Doug Bucket to be a starter last year and um, a lot of pressure on him. I think he goes to Buffalo this year and gets mentored by his, you know, his coach when he grew up as a kid and he can grow into, you know, a goaltender that he, he he's going to be, we know. Uh, he'll be back in Peterborough with us next year. But Zach Higgins, who's 28 now and has been a starter before, and he's going to have, uh, you know, a great guy like uh, Brandon Miller kind of mentor him and Brandon's going to get some time. And then we've got another goal, goalie, Goa, had a great world championship. Uh, he's a young guy at 25 years old. So we've also added some defensive depth with a guy like Ian Lord for us, for me anyway. Sorry, Paul, I just, I just want to cut you out for, for one second. As you mentioned, Goa Abrams, we caught wind that, that potentially that Goa has asked for a trade out of Philadelphia. Can you? He did. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, he, he did after the world, he asked for a trade and, you know, obviously I talked to other teams, gave him permission to talk to some teams and, you know, it didn't work out. We didn't want to trade goal. We, you know, we think he's going to be part of our future. And okay. if we got to carry three goalies, we got to carry three goalies. I okay. mean, he's, he's a young guy. He doesn't have a lot of experience at the top level. We talked after the world's also about, you know, getting up, getting up to in major series lacrosse and, and really growing. Cause at the end of the day, a 24, 25 year old goalie, there hasn't been many in this league. I've been in the league since, you know, 1990, 91. Uh, you know, Dylan Ward, Matt Vince. Del Bianco. Uh, Del, Del Bianco. That's about it. There you go. Yeah. That's, <laughs> That's it. And I'm not it. talking, you know, the M-I-L-L. I mean, it's tough. And especially if you're not playing senior A. Uh, you know, I think in Peterborough this year, we had 34 games. I mean, it's it's a grind to be a goalie and it's like being an NHL defenseman. You've really got to spend some time. So uh, we want him to grow in our organization and, and, you know, be able to, to, to reach his potential. You mentioned Brett Hickey earlier and you're going to get him back. You know, a tough loss early, especially when he's your first pick of the expansion draft a year ago. When you're on a team where you've lost, all these tight games, you have several overtime losses. Having that guy that can, you know, he's going to get you that two or three goals a game that is going to put you over the top this season. Yeah, you know, I, uh, we really liked our offense last year, but to be able to add some, we want to be physical offensively, and that's why we brought a guy like Corey Vitarelli, and then we've got a guy on the left and a guy on the right. Kyle Matisse is a guy that's going to play, you know, almost, He's going to play a lot of offense this year for us as well. So, uh, but Hickey, you know, he's had 50, 50 goals in this league before and I think 46 another time. And, you know, he's in, he's in his late twenties. He's not over the hill. He spent the whole summer training, which we're really excited about. So adding him and Vitarelli inside, I mean, they're hard to handle. I mean, I've been around Corey for a long time and I, Brett used to drive me nuts watching him in Toronto just be so physical. So, I mean, we're we're really excited to have those two guys. Um, I, I've been training all, all summer as well, Coach. Uh, I, I can be physical from, from time to time as well, just, just putting that out there for you. Uh, as we speak with the general manager and head coach, Paul Day, and, and Evan and I were talking about this off the open, and, you know, slow starts were an issue for a little bit. Finishing games were an issue a little bit for, for Philadelphia. I know you at one point tried to make some adjustments in your warm up, and I don't know if, if fitness was a bit of an issue last year, not finishing games in the fourth quarter. What what kind of things did you learn from last year that you want to change going into this year or build upon or take away? You know what I'm saying here, Paul? Like, what kind of yeah, changes? Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, when we went to Vancouver and Sas- Saskatoon and Vancouver weekend, uh, we had nobody left on our practice roster. So we went through 11 rookies last year. Had to, we signed Patrick Rush, who had been at camp with us and he played in Vancouver. So 
I mean, when you go through 11 rookies in the NLL, it's, it's, uh, you you're know, gonna the, struggle. you're going to struggle. You're going to struggle. Absolutely. And I, I mean, I don't, you know, obviously some guys got banged up. I mean, we traded Kluge. Rambo came into his own two or three weeks into, uh, into the season. We only had two weeks of camp and we were excited to see him play. And, uh, I mean, he's, he's like, we moved Kluge just to make room for a guy like Rambo, who we think can excel at the game. And obviously had a pretty good year. At the end of the day, he's only played 18, 17 and uh, indoor games still to this day. Well, Plus, that's the uh, world championships the, here now, Paul. Oh, yeah, there you go. There you go. Right. So let's say he's played 20 games. So he's, you know, last year he's 50% of his potential and, you know, I know he's working pretty hard right now. Like all of us, he gets a month off to train. That's about it. But we we get, you know, the next six weeks to train before we play a game. We think his, you know, his ceiling and Blaze, Blaze is a great player too. So, I mean, these guys we think will, you know, come into their own and, uh, you know, excel even more. So I think yeah, the future is bright for us for sure. Well, the other thing that we talked about and, and – I don't know what the situation is with the Philadelphia Wings, and maybe you can enlighten us a little bit here, Paul, but you look at teams like uh, Buffalo and Toronto and probably Rochester, you can put in that mix, Vancouver. These are all teams where the majority of their roster, if not all of it, are located in the same vicinity, and those teams kind of have a bit – I know there's, there's rules against how many players you can get together with coaches on the floor and how many times per week and all that sort of stuff. But you know where I'm going with this is that, you know, the like Toronto and Buffalo, they can practice midweek on a Tuesday or Wednesday because everybody is together. It's What's the situation in Philadelphia? I don't know how many guys you got in market or where your team practices or what night you guys practice on. Do you do it before yeah. games? Like what? what is the plan? Yeah, so we're – we're we're fortunate that we're owned by the Philadelphia Flyers. They've got two at the Flyers skate zone. They've got two ice. Uh, they got two rinks, and then we've got a twenty four seven lacrosse facility connected to it. So it's funny uh, talking to free agents, and this is not unique for you know if, if you're playing in Rochester like myself. You know I'm less than an hour away. Not bad, but I mean I got we've got majority of our team comes from Peterborough or Whitby or wherever. They're driving two, three hours on a Wednesday night through Toronto traffic in a snowstorm. So when you talk to free agents, you're like, yeah, do you want to get in the car, drive, after you worked eight hours, drive to Rochester, sorry, drive to Six Nations or wherever for practice, drive all the way home, work all week, then drive to the airport, or do you want to train all week, be healthy, because you only get a month off of the season and Get in your car Friday, go to the airport an hour and a half away, jump on a plane and practice, you know, 45 minutes away in Philadelphia. Or if you don't sign with us, you're going to drive around the lake to Rochester five, six hours on a Friday night and play on Saturday. So you've got to be on the road Friday. So it's funny you say that. Uh, Talking to free agents, I mean, there's guys that sign in Philadelphia that would rather spend the time Wednesday at home at the gym training and being with their family. And being hungry when they get to the rink Friday night to practice. And I mean, I think the teams that have won championships, Saskatoon, Georgia, and Calgary, the last four are all teams that, you know, go in Friday night. So, I mean, I think we've used that a bit as a bit of a bargaining chip with, with free agents that are maybe a little older. Jake and I are in this chat group that we have this debate. Oh God, every couple of weeks, I want you to set the record straight. Because you got the best in the business at this. How important are face offs? <laughs> well, I think if you go back to the stats for about ten or twelve years, um, there uh, in the NLL, I mean, there's a thirty second clock. So I mean, they are they're important at times of the game, but they're they're definitely not the most important part of the game. That being said, I think if we can, um, you know, utilize the ball with possessions and uh, you know, late in the game, um, that's going to help us. So I think with some experience and, uh, Trevor likes to play D. So, I mean, he's going to be that much better this year. He's a, he loves the indoor game. He loves box. I shouldn't say indoor. He loves the box game. So <laughs> there's I mean, another debate we've been having indoor or box. And I'm glad you've yeah, it's box. picked the right. Yes. It's thank box. you. Thank you very much. It's box. And I think, uh, you know, 
being around Wiz and Peterborough for a few years, you know, he's a guy that can score goals. And I think I was surprised Trevor didn't score last year. He's a guy that's going to score some goals in this league with confidence and, you know, better understanding the game. But, uh, you know, having Wiz in the summertime sure helped us. So, I, I mean, I think it's not as important as a field game because you're going to get the ball back most of the time, you know, 30 seconds later. So, but it, it's important, but it's definitely... No, you, you, can just stop. you can just stop at important, Paul. That's fine. Uh, I'm glad we cleared that up. Face-offs are important. We hear that, everybody? You want to repeat that one more time, Paul, before we move on? Here? Yeah, I mean, hey. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> No, you know what? I, I, I get it. And I, and I see both sides of the story. Like, you know, it's not the end all be all, like you said, but situational lacrosse, you need to come up with a possession. Face offs are the most important thing ever, right? You're down a goal, fourth quarter, a minute to go, face off at center. You don't win that thing. It's, chances are game over. So I, I get it. It's, I mean, over the grand scheme of a season, probably not the biggest thing you want to focus on, but. There comes a time or two or five throughout the, the course of a year where they are ultimately important. Yeah, it's funny in the past, um, when you're on a team that wins faceoffs all the time, like with Wiz or uh, TB, and you're, you know, someone's hurt or something happens, then you really have to adjust your faceoff setting. And guys aren't used to it. And, uh, you know, we saw that in New West 2017. Yeah. Change the face-off rule. So, uh, of course, this year in the Man Cup, they changed the face-off rule after three or four games as well. <laughs> Don't get me and started. <laughs> Wiz just kind of laughed in the room. He's like, no, I'm good. But I knew it took us a game and a half in New West to get used to it. Our yeah. guys were used to picking it up. So, yeah, you got to – I mean, it's it's all about adjustment. Here, here's, a, here's a crazy idea for you, Paul Day. Uh, how about the sport of lacrosse just adopt one set of rules and go with it? Yeah, I mean, I think a guy like, you know, Eddie Coleman and I, we talk a lot and we spend a lot of time together. And we help, you know, I was coaching the NL Junior NLs and lots of Canadian kids were playing it in Toronto this year. Man, does it speed the game up? The ten second. They don't need oh. to hate these ten seconds for the kids, and no, I it's exciting. And I mean, when it drives me nuts watching kids lacrosse, my little guy or anybody, when the ball is bouncing in the crease in the summertime, and you can't pick it up, yeah, I'm like, just, are you yeah, kidding like me? I, I, I just, I, I don't know, man. Like, I, I don't know why certain organizations are so reluctant for change. Like, it just. Wrap your head around yeah. these are the best set of rules in the game and adopt them and let's move on here. As uh, I, I, you're getting me, you're going to get me riled up here, Paul. Uh, oh, let's, no, <laughs> I'm, even at the minor level, like you know, yeah, my it's crazy. Eight, he plays four on four hockey, half ice, and it is the fastest. It's it's awesome, outstanding. That's yeah. the smallers, and the reason um, I can't believe, like I know guys that I was cops with that played in the NHL. They're like, my kid's not playing lacrosse. I got concussion issues. He's not playing that game at six, seven years old, getting lit up. And it's amazing to me that, you know, we haven't followed suit with, you know, uh, Lacrosse Canada where I'm okay with the cross check and, you know, lean on a guy. But I go to like tight games last year and kids are getting lit up. It's a five minute major game yeah. misconduct in the NL. Yeah. And they're like, yeah. It's on the shoulder. I'm like, no, no. Yeah. This eight, seven year old just got lit up. It's a yard sale. Like, well, uh, that's. I mean, that 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 stems down to you know getting officiating trained properly and a shortage of good officials and all the rest. That's another Pandora's box. We we yeah, should just, go down one day, Paul, but probably not right now. As well, we we want to kind of stay on track here a little bit with the Philadelphia Wings. Um, what do you think of your schedule this year? Uh, obviously would have liked to have started early, but I, I, I like the way the NLs, they've done a pretty good job where, uh, you know, we play Georgia, uh, week three, they play the first week and then they're off a week and then we play them. So, you know, and then we go to Calgary, you know, we're off for a week, then we go to Calgary. So, I mean, two of the best teams we play right out of the hop, but I mean, you know what? I think being around here so long in the NLL, like we're, you know, the schedule is what it is. I, I'm okay with our schedule. Um, you know, I think, uh, especially we're a team last year, like San Diego, we didn't get training camp. So I'm really excited to actually have some time. We used shoot around for two months last season to teach. Uh, yeah. Can't do it. Can't do it. Teach. So, so 
I'm really excited. We're going to be on the floor together. Like we had a couple scrimmages. We've got lots of practice time. You know, we're going to be on the floor 14 times before we play a game. So I, I mean, that's for us, that's huge. Yeah. Massive. And massive. Uh, so I'm, I mean, I like our schedule. Uh, you know, we get to go to Denver and Calgary, two of the pl- best places in the league to play. And I'm excited for that. And we're not back to back like we were Saturday night in, in Saskatoon. Played pretty well. And then we're in the afternoon game in Vancouver. And that, that was <laughs> you didn't like that one? Night. You didn't like that one? No. <laughs> and thank God, we were supposed to be at one o'clock in the afternoon. Thank God there was a, thank God there was a marathon. We got to play at three. Oh, there you and go. I'm like, that was a nightmare weekend. But, no, our schedule's pretty good. You know, we're uh, we're excited about the new divisional lineup, and you know, we're uh, we're pumped to have training camp. Last one for me. I wanted to ask you about a player we had on the podcast about a month ago of yours, Blaze Reardon, and the guy has got the most unique skill set in lacrosse. In that, you know, he he's the top or one of the top goaltenders in the field game and then can pick up a short stick and be an effective you know, forward for you. And even when we talked with Andy Towers, he had mentioned this, that it's the biggest game of the year on their schedule, and they're ready to put Blaze up on attack because they know he can handle the job just, uh, just so well. Have you ever even attempted to put the pads on this guy and maybe see what he can do in a box net? So the, the crazy thing is we didn't know Doug Bucking got hurt last year in Saskatoon. So he played in Vancouver, but had a meniscus problem in his knee. And we went to Georgia and we flew home Monday from Vancouver. That was the day, you know, we could sign extra players. So go, uh, started in Georgia. We won in Georgia, but we had no backup on the bench. So, uh, we put the pads on blaze <laughs> Saturday for shoot around. But again, we had no, like, we literally had no extra players. We had nobody on the practice roster to even activate. So they just said we'd take a two-minute um, delay a game penalty, put the pads on, blaze if something happened, if he got hurt, and then off he'd go. But he's a much better field goal than he's a box <laughs> goal. Like, but, I mean, I knew Blaze when he was a little kid in Rochester. His dad was a season ticket holder, good friends with Tim Sudan. You know, and then, you know, I knew his dad in the 90s, like, when I had good hair, like a long time ago. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, I oh, mean, man. he would, could have signed the year before we went to expansion. I talked to him in the winter. He got cut by Buffalo. Talked, listen, we're coming in next year. I'd love to have you because he's a, you know, he had 20 plus goals last year, full time guy. He, you know, the opportunity is going to get this year. He's, we hope he's going to be a 30 plus guy. And he's fitter than ever. And I talked to him that winter of 2000, I guess. 18 and he could have signed as a practice roster. And I'm like, we would like to be in our top three next year. We really do. And it worked out great. He's like, I'm not going to sign as a practice guy, you know, wait for you guys. So, I mean, he's a committed guy. He lives in Philadelphia now. And this, uh, maybe you see in the field game leader, he's an unbelievable leader. Like yeah. he is obviously the field guy, goaltender, unreal, but he's one of our best leaders in the room. Like I, I, uh, tw- he's 25 years old. Yeah. Well, he That's was a, he was absolutely fantastic to talk to on the pocket. You know, when you talk to a guy for the first time, you really don't know what to expect. And I'd never even had a conversation with Blaze before, but he couldn't have been more well spoken, more well thought out, and uh, was it was a great conversation. Just as you are every time you make an appearance, Paul Day. Uh, we appreciate your time. I can't wait to see year two in Philly and the improvements uh, made by the Wings. I wish you the best of luck. And uh, hey, if you ever run out of run out of players, uh, don't call me. But I know uh, I know you got your boy there, Barstool Jordy, Jordy who's always always oh. ready to go. Keep an eye on that yeah, guy for me, would you? You yeah, thank you very much. Appreciate everything you guys do for the game, him and yourself and Stamper and everything. Else. You guys do a great job. Thank you very much. Oh, our pleasure. Thanks for the conversation. Thanks for the time. That was Paul Day, general manager, head coach of the Philadelphia Wing, also the general manager of the three-time back-to-back-to-back Champion Man Cup, Peterborough Lakers as well. The man is a winner, and I'm sure he's going to get that ship in Philadelphia pointed in the right direction this season. we got to take a break, and we're back with fourth quarter action after this. This is Lacrosse Classified on the Lex All-Stars Podcast Network.
Welcome back to Lacrosse Classified here on the Lax All Stars Podcast Network. Jake Elliott, Evan Scheminauer back with you. This is episode 51. This is the fourth quarter, which means the podcast is almost over. Thanks for hanging out with us here on a Tuesday. And during this segment of the podcast, Evan, we like to do a little thing called news and notes. Usually I share these with you previous to uh, talking about them, but I've kind of fallen into not doing that because I think it gets a more genuine reaction out of you, uh, gives you less time to prepare and think about your your answers, which always makes for a better podcast when you get you get those authentic answers like that. You know what I'm saying? Well, we'll see how it goes. Sometimes I stump. <laughs> the problem I have on the other end is sometimes I start stumble, 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 stumble because I don't have a trained broadcast voice mm. like you do, right? Uh, well, it's so your... it's like, well, uh, hey, uh, listen, uh, well, you think right? <laughs> that, that's okay because I normally edit all that stuff out uh, for you, Evan. But I just want to say, while while you brought that topic up. I don't know if you've done this or not. Like I, every week when we record the episode and before I send it off to Lacrosse All Stars, I'll listen back and make sure it's edited properly and there's no nothing wrong with it as as best I can. Um, so I I listen to every episode and I go through it. But I just I want to say that like from 50 episodes ago when we did episode one, almost a year to the day. Where you have come as far as a podcast or a broadcasting voice, as you put it, and how much more comfortable you are having discussions like we do on a week-to-week basis, interviewing guests, talking about things about lacrosse, has been like (laughs) the growth that you have gone through, Evan, has been like substantial, like really like the, the jump that you have made from your first episode to where you are now is night and day. You should really go back and listen to the first couple of episodes of what you did to where you are now. And and I think you're going to feel a lot better about yourself. I've actually gone back and listened to those episodes a couple of times. It's just, but it's more from a, where were we a year from now standpoint? Um, And it's actually going to be interesting over the next several weeks. We kind of gone through our, you know, proposed guest list and, it's interesting that a number of the guests from the first few episodes, I'm talking like one through four, are likely going to be repeat guests over the next several weeks. Yeah. Yeah, no, and that's okay, right? Like, I mean, because these are some of the best people to talk to in the game. And and I and then, you know, I don't want to hurt my elbow patting myself on our, on on my back here, Evan, but I th- I honestly think that's part of the reason. Like some people like the the banter back and forth. Some people love the who you got and the contest, and some people love the interviews. They love to hear from the minds of the game, whether it be the the GMs or the coaches or the players. That's the part of the podcast that they like. So mm-hmm. you know, here on Lacrosse Classified, we try and appeal to everybody. We try and give everybody a little bit of everything, and I think that's what yeah. makes our podcast one of people's favorites to listen to. Yeah, and I think back to some of the some of my favorite moments on from my end anyways. It was literally a like a last second thought. It was nothing planned or anything like that, right? But all of a sudden just realizing at the end of the Cody Jameson interview as we're coming to a close, ask him about his shot, mm. right? Yeah. Yeah, or you know, just as we're coming to the end of Dan Dawson, like What's the future plan, right? And we get these fabulous answers out of it. And I think that's the thing that I reflect most on. Yeah, and, and for you know, for people that don't know, like for me, <laughs> I remember doing doing the podcast with Brad Challoner and you know, Brad would walk into the studio with like six different sheets of paper and notes on this and questions written down. For me, I probably do it a lot, a little bit different than most people. Like I, I don't have any prefabbed questions that I want to ask. I, you know, I have some things in my mind that I want to want to hit on, but a lot of what I ask is in response to the previous question I asked and the answer that they give me. You know what I mean? So like, yeah. I'll, I'll ask something, and then their, their response prompts me to think of another question that I want to ask them, and and that's kind of how my brain works when when I come into this. Where, you know, you I think when you first started out, you had like, okay, I want to ask this, I want to ask this, and you had all these questions listed out. But that's sometimes not really the way that an interview will go, and 
I don't think it's supposed to go that way. Like a podcast to me is is about having a conversation with somebody and part of having a conversation with somebody. And I know we're way off track here, but I think it's to be a good listener and hear what they're saying and then mm-hmm. feed off of that and then reply to, to that. No, I, I prepare questions, but it's more of a, here's a few, like I'll have like say six bullet points. Exactly. Like, remember to ask about this, 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 right? I don't actually have the question written out in front of me. But you might have used to, to exactly though. How. Did you not, Evan? Like, I was, did yeah. probably at the start. Yeah. Right? That's, what I'm, but, that's what I'm saying, man, is that, you know, back back in the first five episodes, things were a lot different for you than, than mm-hmm. what they are now. So I just, I want to give you a pat on the back, man, because I think you've come a real long way in that department. Well, thank you, because I, I, I'm still much more comfortable behind the keyboard. I'll admit that. Sure you are. I, I, can, I can go back. I can research stats. I can make corrections as I have to, right? And if you think we're editing things on here, like literally what we're editing is bed space. We're not actually taking anything out of the conversation. So uh, you won't see that, but... And it's interesting to find out with various guests just how you sometimes generate the best response. And they're all very different. Yeah. And you got to figure that out. Like, if you think about it, probably the best answer we got out of Jamie Dog a year ago is just asking a very simple question as to whether the shared revenue was a no go for the owners, right? And literally, it took three seconds to ask it. And. That's when we started to find out just how. Well, yeah, I mean, and the, the other one was. was that you know, like how how serious is this? And it was like deadly serious. Like the season is in jeopardy. And I think that was like that was a real eye opener for for both sides to hear that from an owner saying like, hey, like this is this is real serious. We're we're real close to missing a season here. So, um, but it was also the. How many how many non lacrosse people is this all of a sudden going to affect? Right? Yeah. How many people? How many other people's incomes can get affected? Well, the parking, right? the you know, the parking takers and the concession workers and these the arena staffs, like it went on and on. And and like and the last thing I want to mention here about lacrosse classified as we're a year in and you know we, we probably should have done this next week as kind of a, a year in review or whatever, Evan. So we we won't do it next week, but we'll do it this week here. Is that you know when we first started this thing. A year ago, we didn't really have a, a plan laid out on what the podcast was going to be and how the format was going to work. And then, you know, we kind of stumbled into who you got and who we had, and we can't wait to get back to that. And then, you know, the summer came around, and we're like, okay, like, what are we going to do for summer now? And then uh, report cards were born, and you know, a lot of people like those. And then, you know, we went into the world championships and we just, and now we're doing our season previews. And this wasn't something that we had pre-formulated a, a year ago. Like, okay, when we get to October, this is what we're going to, we just kind of figured this thing out as we've gone along here a little bit. And, yeah. and now as we, we hit the year mark going into our next year, like now we have a clear path laid out for us. And I just, I feel like the show has gotten that much better over the last last 12 months and I think it's going to continue to get better as we move forward and and hopefully you know everybody continues to enjoy it hopefully our listenership continues to grow and and our sponsors are happy and all the rest of it uh, because I love doing this I know you do too and and I just I I appreciate everybody that listens to the podcast and I hope you continue to do so yeah no nothing was planned out at all because I think we started the planning for this what three weeks before the first episode aired and literally it was Lax All Stars doesn't have a major box across podcast. We're going to fill that void. Uh, we're going. We. I mean, we use a little bit of the template from Stealth Classified. Sure, a little bit, but it was kind of figuring it out. And you know, I think back to those first two weeks and how much the guest list changed on the fly. But of course, we were reacting to everything just like everybody else was at the time, right? Like, I think the PLPA was not a guest and then was a guest like a day and a half before we were about to tape Yeah, and how everything just changes on the fly like that. Um, which we've now gotten a little better at pre booking people. Yeah. And, like we got but, our, we got our schedule and our kind of routine down when it works for both of us to record and when it works for, for people to be our guests. And, and like, we've kind of figured all that sort of stuff out, which is, which has been a, a big, like it's, 
that's a big thing, right? Like getting the schedule and the routine down is is kind of half the battle a little bit. Uh, we got to get on to news and notes here, Evan, but I just want to give a quick rundown. But, Go ahead. Go ahead. I think the other, the other, the final takeaway is, is that, you know, and sometimes we hear this on the podcast. Sometimes we hear it when we're talking to people off the podcast. But I think the great thing is, is that guests are happy when they get called to be a guest. And, that, and that's a, it's a great compliment to everybody around. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I, I don't know how to put this, but when people look forward to coming here as opposed to, okay, I'm just kind of doing this out of an obligation here, right. here, here, right? Yeah. No, it no. makes for a much better conversation. Totally does. Totally does. And, and, you know, we appreciate all those, those people that, uh, that have been on the show and that continue to come on the show. And, and even like, you know, when I was, I was walking around the, the LEC at the world championships and just had complete strangers. Like I always get people coming up and, or texting me or whatever that, you know, are my friends and I know they listen to the podcast or players or coaches or whoever, you know, saying, Oh, I, you know, I like the show and, and keep doing what you're doing. And, but it's when you get the, the complete stranger that you have no idea, you know, who they are, come up to you and go, Hey, like lacrosse classified is awesome. I love it. Keep, keep doing it or whatever. That to me is like that, that gives me the, the feels, you know what I'm saying? Like when you, when you, you had no idea that, you know, some person out there is, is listening to the podcast every week and, and enjoying the show and, and somehow you stumble upon them and they're like, Hey, you're, you're Jake Kelly or you're Evan Shimon or you do the, the lacrosse classified podcast and, and, uh, I really love it or whatever the case is. So I just, to yeah. everybody out there, players, coaches, managers, owners, uh, listeners, fans, you name it, uh, everybody that, that continues to support lacrosse classified, can't thank you enough um, because this is something we both love to do and, and we want to keep doing it for you. So, you know, you continue to listen. We'll keep bringing it to you. How about that? News and notes, Evan. Uh, that was that was right there. That was like an impromptu 10 minutes of uh, something I did not plan to talk about, but I'm glad, I'm glad we got that out there. Uh, a few teams got their training camps going this weekend, Evan. Uh, Vancouver being one of them. I don't know if we talked about this deal a week ago, but uh, former Saskatchewan Rush player Nick Bielich traded to the Vancouver Warriors for a second-round pick. And uh, uh, from what uh, from what Bradley Challoner was telling me, Nicky was, was going hard on the day one of the Warriors training camp, letting people know what he's going to bring to the table. Yeah, we actually found out about this about a half hour after we stopped taping last week. Um, and there was some sadness in Saskatchewan. I don't, I don't think there's any anger, but there was definitely sadness because Felix is a bit of a favorite here. Sure. Just because of the scrappy type of play that he brings. Um, and he's going to be missed. Now, here's one stat that Adam gave us. Um, that Felix has three titles. Well, he's got the more rest than of that. The, he's got three in the NLL. Three NLL titles. The rest of the Warriors defense combined has two. Beers That's the kind and of, Snyder? Uh, I thought it was Hawksby, but I might be wrong. It could uh, be Hawksby. It could be Hawksby. Oh, Doherty, yeah. maybe? Anyways. It, anyway, it goes back to the Seattle day, or, or, the, or the Washington right. days. Right, right. But, um, you know, that's that's the key for Vancouver is they're getting somebody that's experienced on Saskatchewan side. Here's the key, and oh, some people are asking what's going on. And the, the the truth of the matter is, you've got Nick Finley who's been sitting as a practice roster player for some time. You just drafted a couple other top defensive prospects. There has to be room for these guys to make the roster. Yeah, they can, they can afford to do this. They get a pick back, which is never a bad thing, right? More picks he got. I'm I'm really sad to see Nick go myself, uh, and for people that don't know, when I worked back for Minnesota as a scout, Nick was the first kind of street free agent that uh, I signed uh, for Minnesota, and and you know we'll always kind of have that connection. Nick and I will, and uh, I'm sad to see Nick go, but I, I'm happy to see him get to play in his hometown, and and I'm happy for the Warriors to get a guy like Nick into their camp because I think that's something you can't have enough Nick Beliches in your lineup. You just can't. So I think that's a good mix for both. And and then they get Riley Lowen up front as well. You want to talk about championship experience. Uh, Riley obviously winning cups with Saskatchewan and Calgary. So 
Uh, that's only going to help their team up front as well. Rochester also getting underway. And who else was – there's a third team. I thought that started training camp last weekend. New York. There you go. So Rochester, New York, and Vancouver beginning training camp. The uh, rest of the teams will be following in line in short order. Uh, Connor Robinson re-signing with the Saskatchewan Rush, uh, Evan, and, and that's a good thing. I, I like. I don't think people really realize how good Connor Robinson is going to be. Yeah, they didn't get to see him hardly at all last year, and I think that's that was the problem, but the Rush had a very difficult decision at the expansion draft. Do you keep Connor Robinson or do you keep Curtis Knight? And I know when you and I were asked about this, we had differing opinions for some time. Well, I would have I would have kept Connor. I just thought Jammer's loyalty to his guys, especially Whippy guys. I thought he was just I thought he was gonna keep Niter just because of what he brings to the table, but I like I get it. I think Connor's the younger player with bigger upside oh, yeah. and he's a lefty and all the rest of it, so I don't I don't and begrudge he, the decision whatsoever. The market. Yeah. Absolutely. Right, that's the other key is and that that's that's the reshaping of this deal that likely happened is you know he's he's moving here and you know he's probably due for a bigger pay raise next year the second year contracts still are kind of restricted but um they'll figure it out know, they'll figure it out and keep in mind jeff shatler is yeah two three seasons tops away from retirement yeah um, Doing yeoman's a- work there by the way at standing buffalo evan i saw a nice little piece um online about the Shatler Lacrosse Academy and the work that Jeff Shatler has been doing in Standing Buffalo. Just phenomenal stuff. Phenomenal stuff there from Shots. Yeah, no, I, I've been I've known people down in Standing Buffalo for some time, really good people. Um, and they've developed this lacrosse program, which for the most part is practice out of their high school gymnasium still. So the, the heart that these kids have and they travel an hour down to Regina to play most of their games you know, it's it's something else, even for a minor program. No doubt, no doubt. A uh, couple more news and notes to get to here before we let you go on Lax Class. Uh, you see this this week, Evan. Rachel Valarelli getting a tryout with the New York Riptide. Female goaltender going to Riptide camp. What do you make of this? A little conflicted on it. And I'll just be honest. I, if you know, if if there's a legitimate trial with a legitimate roster shot. Hundred percent for it. I just hope it's not a gimmick. No, and, and I don't think it is. Like I, I saw a little feature that Devin Caney did uh, with her. Like this, this lady looks focused and determined to make her mark on professional lacrosse. And and I don't know. Like I haven't seen her in live game action or even a practice or you know with pros taking shots on her. So I don't know how it's going to go. But I will say this, like. There's nothing wrong with getting some positive media attention either. I don't like the gimmicky stuff, but if this is, like you said, a legit tryout, I don't, I'm okay with it. Like I, I, I think the NLL can use all the feel-good media positive attention it can get. So, And I think that's exactly this. So best of luck to Rachel Valarelli. We're going to follow that story uh, over the next few weeks here. Uh, I know it's not box across, but my my – Gang here in BC, my masters group uh, that go by the name of Antiques Lacrosse. You see the correlation there, Evan? Masters, which is kind of old men lacrosse. Antiques. Antiques Lacrosse, Evan. Uh, heading to Hawaii there every year, and uh, I think the Legends Antiques won the Elite. They bring an Elite team, lots of uh, star-studded players there. I don't, I think Wimmer won the Elite, but I think the Legends and the Grand Masters both taking home gold medals there in Hawaii. I got to get back to Paradise, man. I, I almost have to like turn my Facebook off for a week because I just can't handle seeing all the posts from everybody in Hawaii for a week. Have you ever been? Well, I mean, have you ever yeah, been? I mean, I, I've never been to Hawaii. Now, of course, I lived in Bermuda for so long. Yeah. I, I don't know. Like, it'd be a little bit different culture and whatnot, but the the beauty of Bermuda is so fabulous. I would be hard set to find another island that that does it as well. Sure. Well, there's another thing we got to get we got to get back on t- on task with the Bermuda tournament talk, uh, Evan. I know things got kind of pushed back to the back burner there. I want to get I want to get talking about that again, uh, but not right now. We'll do that though. 
Uh, what else do we got before we let you go? We put out a, a little poll on Twitter on the Lax Class, uh, at Lax Class on Twitter, by the way, about the new loose ball pickup. If you haven't seen it, I posted a little video. Check out the hands there, by the way, Evan, uh, on the on the quick scoop. Uh, but put it out, I said, this, this loose ball pickup needs a new name because what we used to call it way back in my day is no longer appropriate. And I said, I'm going with the Haudenosaunee handle until somebody comes up with something better. You kind of poo-pooed that one away. You didn't like it. Too many syllables or something. I don't know what that's about. Well, Hang, on, like Hang on, Evan. Hang on. Hang on. Hang on, Evan. So um, I think the general consensus here, after all reading all the responses, which there were some great ones out there, by the way, Creator's Cradle, the First Nations Flip, uh, lots of different ones. But I think the simp- the most simple, most respectful name to go for or go with is the Iroquois pickup. Works for me. All right. Done. It shall ever be known now as the Iroquois pickup. If you don't know what I'm talking about, get on Lax Class's Twitter feed. Scroll down. You'll see it. Little video there. Uh, Just it- don't teach your kids it because their coach will probably kill them. Well, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess. I mean, uh, practice at home, practice at the box, and then once you master it, then you can pull it out in a game. That's what I'll tell the kids. Don't be afraid to try new things and use your imaginations out there, kids. But practice that sort of stuff in your backyard, when you're out at the box, during practice, after hours. Master that skill and then bust it out in a game or in an actual live practice. And uh, I don't have a problem with that. You don't want to take the imagination away. You imagine telling John well, Grant Jr., don't <laughs> don't throw backhands in practice or games. No. I, I know mean, that's if John you're, Grant. If you're, in, if you're in tight, it's a great little pickup, right? But if you got the, all the time in the world, sure. Fundamentals. you try that and you miss it. Fundamentals. <laughs> I, see Reese Dutch, I see Reese Dutch pick that ball up like that all the time in games. He's phenomenal at it. Uh, last, but certainly not least here, Evan, some tough news from my hometown. Actually, this isn't the last one, but I, I want to, I want to get this in here, uh, from my hometown, a guy that was absolutely synonymous with Adnac lacrosse since I can remember since I was a little boy, he was, uh, my, my governor when I, when I played there, when I coached there and just the guy that you would see around the rinks in the summertime all the time and, a man that was, you know, I have hold so near and dear Les Wingrove to my heart, but this man has to come in a close second place to what he meant to Coquitlam, Adnac Lacrosse, and Rocky Zimmerman. Uh, like a 50-year career with the Adnacs or something like that. Uh, passing away at the age of 75. His service was last Friday. I had something come up last second and was unable to attend, but... Somebody that I uh, had a ton of respect for and, and held near and dear to my heart and meant so much to, to the purple and gold and will dearly be missed uh, around around Coquillum and in the rinks uh, in the summertime for sure for BC Lacrosse. So uh, rest in peace, Mr. Rocky Zimmerman. Uh, you will be missed. Uh, lastly, here, Evan, uh, I don't know if I'm I'm allowed to break the news. I'm going to do we'll it. We'll see if it's lastly, but yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to do it anyway. Um I'm back, back with the rush for another season in the broadcast booth. Evan, happy to be back with uh, with my partner Ryan Flaherty, and we got another little surprise. I'm not going to spill uh, that uh, you'll be excited to hear about as far as the broadcast goes as well. But I'm also going to be uh, maybe calling a few people. Rush Nation is coming back as well, Evan. We're going to crank out seven episodes. The first one is going to start tomorrow, or not tomorrow. <laughs> The first one is going to come out in November, which is almost tomorrow. It's it's coming out. But uh, seven episodes, November through May, one a month. Uh, so look for, for Rush Hour to be uh, making an appearance, a reappearance once again. And for all you folks uh, in Saskatoon there that are Rush fans, or maybe you're not Rush fans, but you're Lacrosse Classified fans, may, you might see a 604 number pop up on your call display is uh, I'm going to try and sling a few few tickets for Rush Nation. Uh, so I'm going to be calling some people for season tickets, group purchases, you name it. Uh, so if you see a 604 number up, you know it's me. Answer the phone. Let's talk some Rush lacrosse. And, of course, hit you up on, on social media and your DMs if they need tickets. Slide right, right into those <laughs> DMs. Absolutely, yes. Yeah, and speaking of the Rush, their training camp is in Saskatoon this weekend. Um, there is free admission if you do want to go. 
It is actually at the Hank Rice Soccer Center. So it's not at South Tell Center. Don't go there. It's at the Soccer Center up by Lawson Heights. Friday, 3 to 5. Saturday, 10 to 2, or 10 to 12 and 2 to 4. I love the Friday time because Vasily has a soccer game at 6 p.m. at the same place. So <laughs> I don't have to go anywhere. <laughs> Bring a stick. Bring a stick as well. Yeah, no, he'll he'll be in, he'll be in heaven watching them. Awesome, awesome. Uh, then they'll make their way to Toronto, and then they'll make their way to Langley as well for the rest training camp dates over the next few weekends as well. We'll keep you posted on all of it as we move along. Uh, who's up next week, Evan? I gotta I gotta let the people know about that next week. Rochester, San Diego. Rochester, San Diego. We're hoping to have conversations with Dan Carey and Patrick Merrill. Uh, fellas, if you're listening, expect a, a text coming from from Old Jumbo to book you for next week as we want to keep going in alphabetical order here in Rochester and San Diego. We're up next uh, for the Vendor 5th show, our year anniversary show. Can't wait for it. You'll have to wait at least seven days, though. Uh, mm-hmm. But now we got to go, Evan. That was a super and, and long episode. I just want to say quickly mm. is I really appreciate these general managers coming out and just being so honest with us. Yeah. And, uh, you know, in the past, there's always been this tendency to hide things and not talk about injuries and things like that. You know, the honesty is what I love. The honesty is what the fans love. So thank you so much for doing that. Absolutely. 100% uh, agree with that. All right. That was a super long episode. Uh, thanks for sticking with us here. We hope you enjoyed it. Episode number 51 is done. A big thanks to Reggie Thorpe for coming on the program, to Paul Day for stopping by, to you, the loyal listener, as always, checking out Lacrosse Classified every single Tuesday right here on Lacrosse All-Stars, and, of course, our sponsors, Pure Vita Labs, Associated Labels and Packaging, and our good friends at Stampede Tack and Western Wear. Support our sponsors. That's how you support the podcast. Don't forget to subscribe. Wherever you listen to your podcast, you'll find Lacrosse Classified. Smash that subscribe button. Follow us on social media as well. He is at Shem Lax. I am at PXP for sports. And the show is at Lax Class. That's it for Evan Sheminar. I've been Jake Kelly. And for the fastest game on two feet. And for the creator. Thanks for listening to Lacrosse Classified on the Lax All-Stars Podcast Network.